Hello and welcome. Thank you all for joining this forum today. My name is Sarah Nui. I'm a Global Health Security Correspondent at The Telegraph and I'm going to be moderating the panel where we're going to be addressing the importance of testing as a first line of defence against COVID-19. Hosted by FIND, the Foundation for Innovative New Diagnostics, we have a great lineup of distinguished panellists today to discuss the current realities around testing, therapeutics, vaccines and health systems more broadly, as well as the trajectories for the future and what needs to change to ensure we're better prepared for future health threats. The last year has been a bit of a roller coaster for all of us and it's clear the ride is nowhere near over. We just have to look at the devastation in India and its neighbours as a reminder of this. But our experiences have taught us a great deal and it's this that we're really aiming to focus on during this panel. We'll also hear from FIND about the launch of their new strategy, including their mission to drive equitable access to testing and underscore the link between diagnostics and universal health coverage. And of course, the role of testing in preparing for health emergencies. A key outcome of this event will also be the publication of a set of key recommendations for global leaders ahead of the upcoming World Health Assembly. I'll leave it to some Rob panelists to go through these in detail. But the aim is to ensure that testing remains high on the political agenda, with investment committed for local infrastructure and capacity building. But before we dive into all of these details, a few housekeeping points. We'll be quizzing some of our panellists in a little while. Please do submit your questions via the Q&A function on the right hand side of your screen and we'll do our best to answer as many as possible. Also, please join the conversation via social media. We'll be tweeting with the hashtag transform testing. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Also, just to mention the event will be recorded. And so with that, let's crack on. I'm delighted to first hand over to Dr. Sergio Carmona, who is the acting CEO and chief medical officer at FIND. Dr. Carmona, over to you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm Sergio Carmona, the acting CEO at FIND and the chief medical officer. As Sarah pointed out, over the last past year, we have witnessed the heroic endeavors of many frontline health workers around the world, battling an enemy that they've been pretty ill-equipped to fight. This week we saw, the, last week, sorry, the Independent Panel for Pandemic Preparedness and Response uh, released their new report. Um, in there, they estimated that at least 17,000 healthcare workers died of COVID last year. We need to do more to support and protect them. And now, and not only now, but also, so also in the future. Our colleagues in India are witnessing the devastating impact of the pandemic. And as a doctor, my empathy goes to my colleagues there who are facing an overwhelming situation with shortages of basics like oxygen and also overflowing hospital wards. It is really, really heartbreaking and all because this could also be avoided. The IPPR report notes that despite consistent messages that significant change was needed uh, to ensure global protection against pandemic threats, the majority of these recommendations were never implemented. That's it. So in those seven words, the majority of recommendations never were implemented, resulted today in over 3.3 million deaths. We cannot let this happen again and we need to do better. We need to do better for the next time. One thing is now clear and deniably is that quality and timely diagnosis is fundamental to preparedness. If you want to put it in other words, it's the eyes and ears of healthcare. And yet we see again and again that diagnosis is the weakest link in the care cascade. So before the pandemic, we already knew that essential diagnostics tests were available in about 1% of primary care clinics in low and middle income countries. So then when the pandemic hit, the situation got inevitably worse. We saw fragile supply chains and nationalism that sparked fierce competition for the procurement of the few COVID tests that were available early on in the pandemic. Disruptions to essential health services had dire consequences for both infectious as well as non-communicable diseases. So this lack of availability and access to quality, reliable tests for so many major diseases not only threatens our ability to respond to health emergencies, but also jeopardizes the achievement of something key, universal health coverage, right? However, with COVID-19, we've also had an opportunity to learn many good lessons. I'd like to share a few that I think we should build from. One, 
we have witnessed strong regional and country leadership, especially in my home continent of Africa. Two, we have seen the development of new diagnostics as well as digital technologies in record time that we've not experienced or witnessed before. And three, never before has testing been so high in the political agenda everywhere. So this is truly a unique moment in time for testing. And here we are today to talk about how to seize this moment. We know, for example, that after a coal mining accident, a mining town would invest heavily in state-of-the-art emergency rooms and ICUs, an infrastructure that may never be used. So in the context of another emergency, like the pandemic that we've experienced last year, we have seen also a massive increase in the diagnostic manufacturing capacity. But keeping that manufacturing capacity as a warm base during peacetime is going to be a pretty costly exercise, as we know. So there's now an opportunity to preserve some of that capacity for testing um, that is urgently, urgently needed to tackle other major epidemics that by no means are yet under control, such as TB, malaria, and others. We can rebuild uh, for pandemic preparedness, but this time shouldn't be done in isolation. Um, as Dr. Tedros said earlier in the pandemic, universal health coverage and global health security are two sides of, of the same coin. Now, sustainable, resilient health systems depend on balancing those two sides of that coin. We now know that countries, that the country wealth was not a real predictor of pandemic success, but rather was the implementation of public health measures that kept both morbidity and mortality at a minimum. So countries with strong health, strong health systems overall had uh, done much better. Now to find a little bit about the history. So in 2003, FINE, since 2003, FINE has been working to bridge um, the product development gaps for essential diagnostics in collaboration with international research community, the public sector, as well as industry. Last year, FINE, many of us, we stepped into the forefront of the global pandemic response, um, co-leading the diagnostic pillar of the Act Accelerator, alongside with colleagues from the Global Fund and WHO. And I'm happy to see here today uh, both Dr. Tedros addressing us as well as Peter San, who will join us shortly. Today, it's only 475 days after COVID-19 was declared to be a, a public health emergency of international concerns. We're launching our new strategy today, a strategy that was developed during the pandemic. And during this process, we learned many lessons, both from the ACT Accelerator, as well as what had been built through the last two decades of experience in other infectious diseases. I've been part of many discussions recently as well, and it's becoming clearer to me that there's much need for a diagnostic alliance capable of addressing end-to-end -end needs from R&D on one side to access on the other. And what we are trying to do is build from our PDP heritage and many of the lessons learned through the ACT Accelerator framework to maximize the impact with an alliance model in mind. So by pulling our expertise, by working as partners in an alliance, we can be, bring cutting edge diagnostics to market faster at scale and give, as I said earlier, these eyes and ears approach, uh, an approach of high priority in national health, pro in, in national health programs. Our strategy uh, um, it is ambitious. It aims to have high impact. And by the end of 2023, we expect to have at least contributed to 1 million life saves, as well as saving up to about $1 billion to health systems and, and patients. So, Thank you again for joining us today. I'm really honored to be sharing this virtual stage with so many distinguished guests and friends, including our Goodwill Ambassador, Dr. Minata Tauri. With these events, we also are calling on global leaders at the Global Health Summit later this week to ensure that diagnostics and testing underpin the forthcoming Rome Declaration, a key event to be launched on this coming Thursday. 
So Sarah, with that, uh, it's over to you and thank you very much for the opportunity. Thanks, Sergio. Uh, that's a really good way of setting the stage. To further set the scene, we also have um, Dr. Tedros, the Director General of the World Health Organization, who provided this keynote address. Esteemed guests, dear colleagues and friends, I offer my warm thanks to FIND for hosting today's high-level forum. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown a light on the important role of diagnostics and lab services in creating and maintaining strong and agile health systems. Over the past year, Access to fast, accurate, and affordable diagnostics have helped to interrupt disease transmission and track the effectiveness of public health interventions. The Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator has demonstrated the power of partnership for rapidly advancing diagnostic testing, product development, and evaluation. We have created partnerships to expand diagnostic testing worldwide. We have leveraged integrated lab networks to help maintain essential health services. Still, vast disparities persist between high income and low and middle income countries. To tackle this inequality, health systems must be strengthened to enable countries to respond effectively to diagnostic information. We must strengthen the multilateral system, making diagnostics a key part of health system development and emergency preparedness. Without diagnostics, we're flying blind. I welcome this high-level forum and urge all governments and partners to invest in diagnostics as a critical component of health. Working together, we can build a healthier, more resilient world. I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tedros, for that. It's always great to get your insight on the subject. I think we should all keep this idea that without testing, we're flying blind at the forefront of our minds as we go through this event. Next, though, I want to introduce Peter Sands, who is Executive Director of the Global Fund, a co-convener of the Diagnostics Pillar of the ACT Accelerator alongside FIND. Um, Peter, over to you. Thanks for joining us. Hi, I'm going to start by um, both thanking you for joining you and uh, for enabling me to speak, but also um, uh, to apologise. I'm in a car in a rainstorm, so you may have a little bit of uh, background um, noise. Um, let me start by saying that um, over the last year, I have learned more about diagnostics than I ever expected to learn. And that was because of the partnership that the Global Fund and FIND had in co-leading Acta DX. And um, it's been a very productive partnership. We've encountered many challenges, but I also think we have learned a lot about the way different agencies can work together to solve problems in real time. COVID-19 has both highlighted the critical importance diagnostics play in pandemic response, but also in the response to any infectious disease, but also it's exposed, and I think Sergio touched on some of these, um, some of the weaknesses we have in our approach to this vital part of the medical toolbox. Um, from the start, diagnostics played a vital part in the response to COVID, whether it's understanding the spread of the disease, underpinning public health measures, such as test, trace, isolate, or border control. Of course, it's about case management, identifying who to treat, it's played a vital role through regular testing of health workers, ensuring infection control in health facilities to reduce nosocomial infection, but also to protect frontline health workers. It's now playing a vital role in safely opening up 
vital facilities such as schools or particular essential services. And then most recently, with the emergence of variants, the spectrum of diagnostics is playing all the way from basic uh, disease identification and pattern and recognition through to genomic surveillance and sequencing in terms of identifying variants of concern and potential vaccine escape. And there've been some great successes. I actually think the speed of identifying um, PCR tools very quickly in the pandemic, the speed with which automated PCR was made available, the speed with which we found high quality antigen RDTs are actually testimony to the scientific and production capabilities of what is a very fragmented industry. Yeah, against those successes, what I would say, and again, Sergio has mentioned some of these, there were manufacturing capacity and deployment constraints on basically every element of um, diagnostics, including really basic things like swabs, let alone automated PCR cartridges. Second, um, we've encountered significant quality issues and inconsistent standards and evaluation approaches um, which have undermined the quality, the credibility, particularly of antigen RDTs in, in a way that is still creating problems for us all today. Third, I think there has been and still are, it, are inconsistent messages about the way we should use different diagnostic tools, the different use cases. And there's lots of confusion and misunderstanding still, for example, around antigen RDTs. Fourth, there have been pervasive issues of local capacity. Again, there have been some great counterexamples. Um, the Africa CDC is a really good counterexample, um, but many, many countries have struggled um, with laboratory capacity, the ability to actually implement uh, testing strategies of different types. And I think one of the things that has come across is the upside from addressing a range of these issues, not least massive upside in terms of untapped scope for innovation, whether it's in self-testing or low cost point of care PCR or multiplexed um, dig diagnostic tools or, or automated digital linkages. So that if people are self-testing, the vital data is getting uploaded in a very cost efficient and seamless um, manner. One of my big takeaways as the executive director of the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB and Malaria, not, not actually COVID, although that's obviously been absorbing a lot of our attention over the course of the last year, is that actually we need to up our game on diagnostics on the other diseases as well. For TB, where the biggest single issue to beating the epidemic, and remember TB is the second largest killer after COVID in the world, for TB, getting low cost point of care PCR diagnostics that allow you to identify TB quickly, including drug resistant variants, would be transformational in fighting the disease. In HIV, I'd say the big area of um, interest and development is how you enable self testing, but also the linkage into enrollment and treatment. So you don't have the drop between those who test positive and those who enroll in treatment. And for malaria, I think the most natural and one of the most powerful areas of development is how we move a lot of the case identification from being a yes, no question on whether or not a child with a fever has malaria to a more multiplex diagnostic solution, which is more about febrile management. And that, of course, is also incredibly powerful in the context of uh, future pandemic preparedness. So when I look at this space and reflect on the partnership I've had with FIND over the course of the last 15 months or so um, as we've combated COVID, I really see uh, a, an important role for FIND to play across this value chain across the ecosystem to ensure that we have better, more innovative, 
cheaper, more widely available diagnostic tools, that there is a better understanding of how to use them and integrate them into either case management or public health strategies. And also that the partnership works even more seamlessly. So organizations like the Global Fund, which are all about deployment at scale, are very plugged into an understanding of what's coming down the pipeline in terms of diagnostics. And organizations like FIND are fully informed as to what's really needed and what would make most difference from a fighting a disease point of view. So um, I, um, I'm delighted to see the new strategy for FIND. Um, and I also want to thank the team at FIND for the partnership the Global Fund has had before COVID, yes, but in, yeah, immeasurably deepened by the experience of working together um, during COVID. And I think you have a I think you have a very, very full agenda and a very important role to play. And one of the important strategic challenges you will face is frankly around prioritization of working out which aspects of the quite kind of chaotic diagnostics landscape are the ones that will actually deliver most benefit in terms of saving lives and protecting people from future threats. So thank you very much. Peter, I think you muted yourself too soon. <laughs> oh, sorry. That was, um, well, I don't know where you lost me. I was just going to say thank you for um, <laughs> the partnership, for the work you're doing. And um, I congratulate you on your new strategy. You have a huge role to play, both in saving lives now and protecting people from future threats. Thank you. Thanks, you, Peter. Tara, over to you. Thank you very much, Peter. That was really useful. And I think it's striking that so many of our initial conversations have emphasised partnership, how far we've come, but also how far we've got left to go. So with that all in mind, let's head to the next stage of our discussion. So we're going to be talking to a range of experts. Make sure you stick around, though, because afterwards, um, Dr. Aminata Torre, who is the former Prime Minister of Senegal and a fine goodwill ambassador, is going to outline those recommendations that we mentioned earlier. So um, with that, let's let's dive into the panelists. Keep your questions coming and keep the conversation going on social media with the transforming testing hashtag. Um, but I'm really excited to introduce our first panelist. Each one is going to speak for about five minutes and then we'll, as I say, dive into questions. So Peter Ngola Awiti is the Executive Director of Woke Youth Development Projects, which aims to improve knowledge and behaviour of young people in Kenya to prevent the transmission of HIV and AIDS. Peter, the floor is yours, looking forward to it. Yeah, thank you very much. And I'm very happy to uh, join other panelists in the role of community uh, in uh, all these uh, uh, diagnostics across the diseases. Uh, the community plays a very important role, uh, uh, particularly because it's the first level of healthcare. I remember when I was growing up, my mom, uh, whenever I have fever or shivering, my mom would tell me to pass urine in a basin. And if the urine is very uh, uh, concentrated and a fever, she would take, uh, take me to the hospital because, because I come from a malaria prone area. And that was a local diagnostic that, that gives the community the importance of diagnostics. Many years later in 2013, uh, uh, there was a, a United Nations launched the 1 million healthcare workers campaign. And this was uh, strategically meant to support the uh, professional healthcare workers to train 1 million lay workers to provide services at community level. And uh, uh, in this area, 
we also saw global fund coming up, particularly in C19 RM applications, supporting community engagement so that they are being able to, to do diagnostics. But these diagnostics, uh, <clears throat> in spite of the fact that they have been successful, most of the diagnostics are still being uh, at the point of care. We have seen that in particularly in TB, where the first point of diagnostic is the PCR, the gene expert, which again has been very expensive for low and middle income countries uh, because of the $20 per cartridge. Even though the price has come down, the campaign is still on to $5 per cartridge, which has not been very successful uh, with the CEFID. It is in this respect that we find that the communities should be given an opportunity to use science and technology to do diagnostics, because most of the times they are doing only screening. Fortunately enough, HIV has gone further ahead to have self-testing kit. And that is now very user-friendly at the community level. TB has not been very successful in this area. At, on COVID, the community has been surcharged because there is not widespread use of uh, antigen uh, uh, diagnostic, uh, rapid diagnostic test at community level. We still have a lot of pile up at border centers because it's only the PCR that has to be used in this diagnostics. And that means there has to be need to develop wider spectrum of diagnostics and use science at community level because the community is the first point where the diagnostics should take place before with a, a very well knit referral system for confirmation at the health facility and also enrollment into treatment. We have had very good success at community level where the community, uh, some task has been shifted to communities like sputum tra uh, transportation, triaging at the outpatient dispensaries, health education at community level, social marketing, particularly in COVID, most of the masks were being marketed by communities at community level at a very affordable cost. And lastly, uh, 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 the testing should be made accurate. In this respect, what are the lessons that we have learned from COVID? When the pandemic struck, uh, struck in, uh, in 2020, the community was turned into the enemies of the response. We find most of the, 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 the response was transformed into, uh, in, in, into police, uh, uh, into the hands of police enforcement where the community health volunteers were being arrested for being out late or for some areas being uh, blocked out for community health workers. And, and for, therefore we, this, we did not take advantage of the community health workers in the response to, to, uh, to COVID-19. We know police cannot arrest everybody. At, at, at the community spread level of COVID, it is now the community, the healthcare has to be transferred to communities so that they respond adequately. We should <clears throat> plant into the community the culture of health so that the communities can able to manage their own health and only goes to the, uh, and, that, uh, and that will help us to reduce uh, diseases like diabetes, like high blood pressure, because the community will be able to be part of their part of their health and able to, to to respond to their health. They are able to use available diagnostics to know when their sugar level is high. They should be able to uh, 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 to to know when they have a fever and what kind of fever they are. 
we need to equip the community well in advance so that they can be able to respond to some of that uh, primary healthcare issues. And lastly, we, uh, we, we need to be partners with the communities because we cannot enforce laws within the communities if we don't support communities to provide the relevant diagnostics and make a, a, a well-sounding referral system. That is what we envisage to have the community. And I want to put my, 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 my uh, thanks to uh, Peter Sands for the C19RM uh, funding, which most of it is going to support communities into meaningful engagement. And we look forward to a community response that will eliminate TB, HIV, uh, malaria, and lastly, COVID. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, I think it's striking, you're right, it's not just about the tools that we have, it's about how we use them and how we roll them out. Um, but we'll, we'll probably come back to that in the, in the questions. I now want to pass over to Jayashri Ayer, who's the Executive Director of Access to Medicine, which is an organisation that works closely with the pharmaceutical industry to encourage them to do more with the types of people that you're talking about, Peter, those living in low and middle income countries. So Jayashri, over to you. Oh, thank you for inviting me to this important discussion and hello everyone. So I mean, as, um, as Sarah mentioned, I'm, you know, I work for the Access Medicine Foundation. We've been for about 15 years, uh, been tracking the pharmaceutical industry on access issues. Um, and while we are called the Access to Medicine Foundation, we work more and more with uh, medicines, vaccines and diagnostics. So we've got companies such as Roche, uh, Merck, KGAA and Abbott, uh, and we look at their work in increasing access to their current marketed diagnostics and uh, technologies needed for diagnostics. And we encourage more companies to invest in diagnostic development and access. Uh, what we also do is we leverage policies of uh, governments, so governments invest more in, in uh, cost-effective ways to improve um, uh, diagnostic testing, access uh, development. Um, and importantly, what we look at is also an increasing engagement uh, by institutional investors. So these are investors that invest in the pharmaceutical industry and the diagnostic industry uh, to ensure that their investment in global health priorities uh, are, are supported and uh, eventually we get equitable uh, access to the key commodities that are being developed by these companies. So at the moment, we've got about 100 um, invest institutional investors that uh, support our work and use it. Um, now, a couple of reflections on what uh, we've learned from COVID um, that has helped us uh, plan for the future, us being society. And I'm very happy to see that many of these elements are in the uh, new strategy of, of FIND. Um, I think what we've seen is that the real issue in, in many countries is the limited uh, testing capacity. And even when tests are there, they don't always get uh, used or optimally used. And even if they get used, they don't always get reported. Even if they're reported, the right treatments may not always be available for patients who need them. So this tells you that uh, this is not only an issue for COVID-19, uh, but really an issue that we start seeing in, in many other disease areas. Uh, some of my colleagues have mentioned uh, tuberculosis, malaria, we're starting to see this also in a lot of non-communicable diseases. Um, so I think we, when, when we looked at our data last year, we saw that um, around the uh, middle of 2020, uh, fewer than one in five health facilities across the uh, um, continent of, South, uh, of Africa had access to COVID-19 tests. So it tells you that basically that um, uh, access is not particularly a given in, in any uh, component. What COVID-19 has done is it, it has exposed sort of the impact of years of, sort of neglect in testing for all diseases um, with kind of diagnostics being one of the weakest links in the care cascade um, in conditions ranging from uh, HIV to TB, um, uh, diabetes, hypertension. And at the end of it, it is the, the people living in low and middle income countries that are disproportionately bearing the burden of this. So um, I'd like to kind of talk a bit about the diagnostic industry. Um, it's clear that the diagnostic industry has a, a, a responsibility, but also when you think about it, an opportunity uh, to engage in, in, in global health in a, in a more uh, active way. They definitely have seen that uh, companies and their investors have increasingly recognized the need to, to partner and to have the right tests available for access. Uh, companies have also started recognizing that they can't sell their drugs if uh, patients are, are not um, coming to hospitals and, and, and being safe in that sense. So this goes for any uh, medicine that they're trying to, to, to sell. So that, that 
increasing recognition uh, from the industry um, is, is something that we've seen in our data. Uh, but at the end, uh, we still see very limited investment. Um, but more and more companies are uh, looking at key areas where they're looking across the whole continuum of care. I'll give a couple of examples. Uh, Roche, for example, has been working across the different continuum of care for breast cancer and HIV, partnering with, uh, with many organizations to make sure that diagnostics and uh, treatments are available side by side in the health facilities that, that they work with. Uh, Novo Nordisk works with Roche on, on uh, certain facilities to make sure diabetes testing is available alongside their treatment. And more recently, um, with uh, sickle cell disease uh, and the involvement of Novartis and some of their partners in, in access. Um, what I think is really an important uh, thing to note is that for the past 25 years, um, we've seen many large players leaving infectious disease research, um, unearthing a more awareness, but also a role for, for biotech companies. Um, but then at the end of it, uh, the financing availability, uh, production capacity, and the ab ab ability to bring uh, innovations really to global markets uh, becomes low. So at the end, you end up seeing more public spending. And this is, of course, true. Um, uh, on top of that, of course, we have an extremely fragmented industry. And we're just looking at the diagnostic industry in, in its own with many sort of uh, large players, uh, with many with few large players and many small players across the whole world. So how do we make sure that they all remain engaged in, in, in um, investing in, in diagnostics is an important aspect for us to look at when we think of future pandemics. So how do we do that? I think one of the first steps uh, has already been um, identified as uh, making sure that we assemble and identify priorities, what needs to be done um, this includes not only the priorities when it comes to the components, so how much of point of care testing do we need, are they simple enough to use in resource limited settings, um, there's a lot more in, in, uh, engagement in uh, target product profiles so that the right product is, is created for the right diseases and for the right patients. Uh, we have in the last Access to Medicine Index uh, been looking at uh, some data uh, where the World Health Organizations and Policy Cures uh, Research have identified uh, 200, over 200 specific medicines, vaccines, diagnostic tests, and other products that are urgently needed by people living in low and middle income countries as a, as a call to action to say, these are the, the areas where we need to see investment. And what we found in our data is that 149 out of these over 200 priority gaps go completely unaddressed with, with, no, with no investment at all from some of the 20 biggest companies in the world. Um, of course, as I said, there might be a couple of, uh, of diagnostic companies and other uh, smaller companies engaged, but you really expect some of the big ones to, to get involved in this. And um, while, um, and of course, at the end of it, it's not only about investment into R&D, it also, uh, at the end, needs to be accessible. And what we know is that diagnostic testing and LMICs uh, need to be cheaper, faster, uh, reliable, and easy to use in the field. And, um, but equitable access for the whole world is not a given. Uh, by nature, when you have a product, it's not only a uh, given that the product is going to be made available for uh, patients that uh, suffer the highest burden or across the board in, in the whole world. Um, so not only do we need R&D of testing and digital tools to, to track, record and trace, but we also need uh, equitable access uh, covering areas such as affordability, making sure that there's adequate supply um, uh, around the world. Um, reducing the dependency of supply coming from one or two players uh, who are the main producers, uh, making sure that workforce and infrastructure is actually available and constantly invested in so that it is maintained uh, across uh, uh, longer periods of time. So I think I'd like to just main, uh, mainly conclude by saying that the decisions that we make today as a society, I think, have a real big implication on, on access downstream. So we've always been a strong advocate for early access planning and uh, the public investment going into cost-effective solutions such as product development partnerships, such as uh, FIND. I think we've seen that working with product development partnerships has increased access and coordination in both financing and investment. And finally, at the end of it, leads to more products reaching the patients who really need them. So we've actually seen that there are mechanisms that luckily have been invested in uh, for many years in diagnostics, there has been organizations such as FIND, uh, in vaccines has been uh, Gavi, CEPI, for medicines has been Global Fund. And if we didn't have those sort of investments for the last number of years, we wouldn't be where we are today, even with COVID-19 uh, in that sense. So um, I think that we definitely have seen an increasing role, but there are some concerns in basically making sure that more industry uh, engages in, in, in uh, access. Because if we 
how can we prevent another epidemic or a pandemic if we can't even identify or prevent it? Thank you. There's a lot of work to be done. <laughs> is the message I'm getting from you. We're, we've made a lot of progress, but we should not rest on our laurels. Um, I think that's probably quite good as we look at the fine strategy. Um, next up, we have Dr. Sarah Serdas. She's a member of the European Parliament from Portugal. Um, she's a medical doctor, sits on the Public Health Committee of the Parliament and is a vocal activist on issues surrounding access to health. Unfortunately, Sarah can't join us directly any longer, but she sent us some remarks via video, um, which I think we're about to see. Hello everyone, Sara Serdes here. I'm a member of the European Parliament. I would like to start by thanking FINE for inviting me for this high-level forum on diagnostic uh, testing. Um, we need to understand that uh, pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic, showed us the vulnerabilities we have in regards of not only data, but also on supply of products, supply of medicines, medical products, and also availability and manufacturing capacities along the globe. So there's many lessons learned from the pandemic and I would like to highlight a few of them. First and foremost is something that is quite bluntly there, but it needs to be said, which is member states need to work together and have a coordinated response. And this is needed in order for us to increase our efficiency because our health resources are limited. All around the globe, our resources are limited. So if we want to tackle a global virus, a destroyer of health systems, we need to have a coordinated response. And for this, we need better preparedness and response for future health threats. We need to support the creation of stockpiles of uh, essential medical products uh, and increase the accessibility worldwide, not only to medicines, but also to testing and diagnostic uh, equipment. For this, we must work to increase the quality standards for everyone and improve the universal health coverage. We must not forget we're going through a crisis, through a pandemic, but we still want to reach the goals for the Sustainable Development Goals in 2030. And we will do this only by working together, by investing in, in strengthening our health systems, making them more resilient, and also not forgetting the core of our healthcare systems, training our healthcare workforce and making opportunities and making their uh, work conditions uh, improve their work conditions as they need as they were very strained by this pandemic in the last couple um, in the last months but also the last year uh, talking a bit about uh, the response by the pandemic by the eu uh, we have that the european commission created a team to respond to the outbreak to support the research not only on vaccines and diagnostics uh, uh, tools such as tests, but also for treatment. Also issued the guidelines on measures on how to, to stop the spreading of virus. This was done by the ECDC, our technical scientific body. Also, the EU has worked into the repatriation of EU citizens when the pandemic first hit. And something quite essential, it provided funding through the Coronavirus Response Initiative for and through liquidity of the European Investment Fund. What does this mean? That we're going to a sanitary crisis, a health crisis, but also that brings with it a bigger uh, social and economic crisis. And lessons learned from the 28, uh, 2008 crisis is that we cannot meet economic setbacks by cuts so in this regard, we invest money on families, on companies in order to save jobs and guarantee the finances of our families and companies. And we protected jobs. We did this through the sure mechanism. And this was very important not to increase the unemployment rate. We also, um, the EU is also committed in ensuring universal access to COVID-19 vaccines through the COVAX mechanism. We have been one of the biggest donors. I want to stress that it's important that everyone 
contribute to this COVAX initiative uh, because as we see it right now throughout the globe, we see quite an unequal distribution of vaccines. Some low and middle income countries still are struggling behind to meet their, their vaccination rates, especially the most vulnerable groups are still not protected. And these vulnerable groups is healthcare workers. So there are still parts of the world where healthcare workers are fighting the pandemic on the front line and they are not protected from the virus. So I, I would like to just increase and raise this pledge to, to all states to, to, to donate to, to COVAX mechanism. And I would like to highlight something that uh, Dr. Tedros uh, stated yesterday that instead of starting vaccinating teenagers, which we know are not on, uh, is not a risk group for, for COVID-19, we should, member states that have this capacity should uh, donate for the COVAX mechanism. What did you did in order to respond to the pandemic? We something that we worked very very hard was on making health a priority and we worked on having a true european health union this was done through the eu for health which is the health program for seven years is the first standalone health program and it was needed a pandemic to have a standalone health program in the eu and we have 5.1 billions in order to invest to health promotion, disease prevention, health threats, international collaboration and better accessibility to medicines and medical products. All of this in a health in all policies and a one health approach. This is very important for us to have a convergent um, way of dealing with the health topics at the Union. Other tools that we have in our regard is we're going to increase the mandates of the ECDC, of the EMI, to strengthen the EU response to cross-border health threats. We're going, there's already the HERA incubator ongoing, which is uh, quite um, qu quite a, a, a innovation. And also uh, the pharma strategy and the European beating cancer plan, which is something that if worked together, can also tackle other non-communicable diseases. So politicians and policymakers now understand the true value of health and that health cannot be dissociated from all the other social determinants. For this, um, it's important to invest in health in all policies as all policies will have a huge impact in everyone's life and especially having the health care pers health perspective not healthcare because health is more broad than healthcare the health perspective on all policies that is done so i would like just to finalize stating that this is the moment to build bridges to involve all stakeholders in, in the discussion and for this I would like just to stress the needs to improve the access to diagnosis uh, on COVID-19 because this is the first step for us to understand what we are dealing with, what, did, what is the momentum, what is the, the status of the pandemic. So um, I would like to thank you everyone for again for inviting me here. And thank everyone for the discussion and for bringing more awareness to the need of investing in diagnosis and in testing for COVID-19. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Sarah, um, for that very thorough overview. I think there are some key themes emerging around access not being inevitable and that you know the pandemic really has demonstrated the importance of health. Um, next up, our final panellist, um, just for a couple of minutes before we get into the questions, is Dr. Hayat Sindhi. Um, she is the Chief Advisor for the Islamic, Islamic Development Bank, um, which aids the development of its 57 member nations across several sectors, including science, technology, innovation and health. So Dr. Sindhi, a couple of minutes for your opening thoughts. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah, for uh, your kind uh, introduction. Uh, Dr. Sergio Carmona, the acting uh, CEO of FIND, uh, Dr. Aminata Tori, uh, FIND Gul Ambassadors, and Dr. 
Tedros and distinguished guests, uh, panelists, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good afternoon from Jeddah. It's really my great pleasure on behalf of the Islamic Development Bank Group to express my gratitude really for inviting me to this important, especially to me, round table just to discuss the, the diagnostic lessons learned uh, from COVID-19 and how we can prepare for the future pandemics and how wise uh, access to um, uh, testing is a fundamental to achieving the global goal of uh, universal health coverage. I would like to spend a few minutes uh, to really to share with you what uh, how ISDB did the response and last year and of course continuing responding this year. But before I start uh, uh, talking about ISDB experience, listening to the um, uh, Sergio and Dr. Tori and Tedros and Peter and Sarah and, and uh, Peter San, uh, for us, uh, the lesson learned, of course, from also from our experience as, as a scientist and from ISDB experience and as also biotechnologists, it's come to that, that we all agree that um, the, the, the lesson learned from uh, COVID-19 that uh, the role of uh, the vital role of locally developed innovation and transfer of technology is, is, a, is a must to fight this COVID-19. Also uh, from the past uh, epidemics and listening to Sergio and Peter and Tedros, without you know, uh, appropriate diagnostic tools, devices, uh, therapeutic and vaccine, we cannot fight this, we cannot control this, we cannot contain this, so we need that. And also the current manufacturing capacity, uh, especially in the developing countries, as you know, uh, SDB um, look after 57 countries, 21 of them least developing countries. So the, the developing, uh, the manufacturing capacity is far off from meeting the, the global demand and also the local demand. So from that, we come also the conclusion that we need to strengthen the global partnership to encourage and leverage locally developed innovations and facilitate technology transfer for strengthening global supply COVID-19 diagnostic and be prepared for the future pandemic by leveraging and building manufacturing capacity in, in member countries and of course in least developing countries. So how, what is what we what did we do last year? How, how the Islamic Development Bank reacted toward this? First of all, in the beginning, um, ISDB helped its member country by coming with a special package, what we call it the, the three R's package, which is response, restore, and restart, and is about $2.3 billion type of financing facilities. And that's going to help to preventing, containing, mitigating, and recovering from impact of COVID-19 pandemic. And also with that, we have a, a new blended finance innovative model, what we call it 5P, which is coined by, the, by His Excellency Dr. Badr Hajjar, which is um, 5P is for public, private, philanthropy, people partnership. And that's to adopt and to ensure the success of the program. And as you can see from the, all the stakeholders involved, so all the 5Ps have a critical role to play in terms of co-financing, implementing, implementation of modality, networking and supporting manufacturing capacity to strengthen and tie between the demand and supply. So that's what first uh, what we did. And also to strengthen the, 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 develop, the technical de development and uh, innovation, we, uh, which is a vital component as we agreed from the start uh, to overcome the pandemic, we dedicated the call at uh, the Transform Fund call for innovation last year for, we challenge uh, the whole uh, scientific uh, community around the world, research institution to come with, from the start, we recognize diagnostics important. So we challenge the whole community around the world to come with the low diagnostic, new innovative idea from local communities. We also ask them to come with a better understanding how we can uh, you know, encourage the capacity building within the whole health value chain. And, and luckily through the Transform Fund, we receive about 4,700 interest. We picked from that uh, top 30. And you can see that we go through rigorous type of selection. And of course, with help with uh, Alan, uh, he's amazing and, and WHO and PATH, they went through uh, and to select the best uh, uh, innovation. And because we understand uh, the role of global partnership, we are partnering now with WHO to mainstream those ideas, these ideas that we picked 
through their own uh, offices and capacity. And I just want to give you two examples, uh, Sarah, I know the time, but it's nice to see a practical and, and a real example. So one of the examples that we sponsor a molecular diagnostic and DNA testing platform for healthcare delivery in Nigeria. Because as you know, Nigeria is over 200 million and it's, this is an innovative solution connect hospitals, clinics, medical labs, academics, and researchers to specialize molecular diagnostics and DNA testing through a robust supply chain within national wide footprint in the whole Nigeria. Another example quickly is an amazing portable dual energy X-ray detector that can be taken to the patient for monitoring uh, COVID-19 infection. Also, it can determine the right time to put the COVID-19 patient uh, on ventilators to optimize both uh, ventilator usage and uh, patient recovery time. And also it can help to confirm through imaging whether the patient is responding or not. And it's going to be in the whole, in a way, in Pakistan. Um, and other thing I wanted to emphasize here and listening to Peter San and, and Peter and Sergey and, and um, and Sarah, is that um, we identify uh, the, to strengthen our global partnership with the health uh, field. So um, we identify a certain partner and they're going to uh, address two major solutions. For us, as all of you agree, and we all of you know, one of the first solutions that identify we need to really uh, address is how we're going to strengthen the national labs system for priority medical testing, like for example, malaria, HIV, HPV, uh, HIV, uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, within our member countries. And we were doing that with the halters. So we're going to have a, like a roadmap for selected countries, tell us what is the priority disease, how we can also uh, the five blending uh, finance model help for uh, affordable availability of testing capability. And I can go that later on with more question. The second solution also implementing in partnership with PATH, similar to address these challenges, but this time we're focusing on the diff market analysis to build a robust evidence base capacity building and investment framework to support ISDB member country to identify high impact investment that can be leveraged to build local manufacturing capacity. And that's very, very crucial because we don't know who is the right partnership. And a lot of our membership, they ask for help. So we need to really partner with the great global partner to really identify that. Finally, I wanted to, to uh, also to uh, mention to you, Sarah, and to the rest of the uh, guests here, we also tackled the root problem. We devoted part of our scholarship program with the, the World Academy of Science to help give a scholarship for strengthening the health system within our member countries. And what we're doing this year, we know about the uh, inequality distribution of the vaccine. So we came also, we developed a, what we call it ISDB group vaccine access facility. We call it IVAC program. And this IVAC program will help to adopt holistic approach to providing access to COVID-19, focusing on phases of health supplies development, manufacturing, delivery to its beneficiaries, and at the same time, ensure long-term self-reliance through technology transfer and capacity building. And this year, we dedicated also the call for innovation, the four call for innovation for the Transform Fund on building resilience through innovation in response to COVID-19 pandemic. And the aim to identify, we also challenging the scientific institution and research lab to um, identify and leverage the scale up of innovation solutions that relate to the procurement, development and transfer of innovative technology that can contribute to boosting local manufacturing capacity of ISD member country for production of uh, COVID-19 vaccination. So my concluding remarks, Sarah, and to the rest of the panel, thank you for giving me the time. I hope this discussion, because I said, you know, how the SDB uh, look at, at, the, at, the, at the matter, and we tackle all the angles, really. Uh, innovative financial solution, listening to our member country, talking to innovation, talking to scientists, um, uh, uh, tapping to the scholarship, tapping to the local, uh, you know, uh, uh, innovation, and also have a great uh, 
partnership. I hope this uh, discussion will really uh, help to strengthen the R&D and manufacturing capacity within the developing countries, especially in the least developing country. But of course, we cannot do that alone. That's why we have in this seminar, that's why we need to have the right partnership and through the science technology department within ISDB. And I just want to let you know, we're the only multilateral <laughs> Bank have science, technology, innovation department. We hope that we can identify great partnership like with FIND, with WHO, uh, with, with, with Ellen and, and with you, Sarah. You know, you, you're a great, uh, will be facilitated for, for um, um, making awareness of this and to hope that we are committed, ISDB, to find the right um, countries, identify the right countries within our member country who has the, the potential to uh, ha have their own uh, manufacturing capability within our country. And we are committed to uh, toward expanding the agnostic manufacturing to achieve a new public health order for, it, for its health and economic security. And thank you again well, for giving me the floor. Well, no, thank you very much, Hayat. That was a really interesting overview of the work you've been doing and the challenges that you faced. Um, we have about 10 minutes of questions and we've got loads of questions. So I'm going to ask the panellists, please try and answer with just one, one or two minutes your key thoughts with the questions. So I want to get through as many as possible. Um, I'm going to start with Jayashri. Um, there have been some questions about um, how we ensure that testing um, also tackles variants. That's really becoming increasingly apparent in the second half. Um, I want, what are your thoughts on how do we, what do we need to do to strengthen real-time surveillance and mass testing to ensure that we nip these sorts of new variants or hotspots of existing variants in the bud? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so I'll, I'll speak from my capacity of, uh, you know, looking at how uh, industry and global health players work on these kind of issues. I think that, that there's a lot of barriers that we do, we've, that's already been identified and uh, has been identified also, you know, before COVID and, and now during COVID. I do think that uh, making sure that there uh, that there are key organizations who are working uh, alongside making sure that these barriers are being uh, addressed um, alongside uh, the availability of testing, uh, it kind of goes hand in hand. So um, I think um, uh, there's a few key things that we need to look at. We need definitely need to look at uh, financial investment into uh, capacity and infrastructure development. We need to look at uh, better validation of, 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 of testing uh, and better validation of laboratory and, 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 and trained uh, healthcare workers who are able to, to do the testing uh, properly. And I do think that um, uh, that financing model must come from multiple uh, sources. It cannot all come directly from industry or only for the public sector. It must be a, a mixed um, a bag that comes to invest in, in this particular uh, space. So I thought uh, that would be my main intervention in this short amount of time. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I wish I had more time to discuss. Um, Sergio, I think is here too, and there's a question for him about FIND. Um, is FIND committed to both attract more investors and actors upstream in the development process, but also place conditions on that process and our research and development, especially when using public financing to ensure equitable access downstream? What would you say to that, Sergio? For sure, so FIND has been working hard in this pandemic also to diversify its pool of, of funders and very much in the conditions that we put uh, equitable access so, uh, and not to leave anyone behind. The, so it is part of the, the key conditions um, uh, of, of those investments access. Well, I've got you actually as well. There's a question about non-communicable diseases being responsible, you know, for 70% of deaths worldwide. Um, how is this going to be involved in the next stage of strategy and what gaps exist in terms of creating diagnostics to tackle non-communicable diseases? How are we going to address that? Yeah, it's, it's a tricky question. I mean, FINE has in the past and until now been very much focused on infectious diseases and, and, and high burden uh, causes of mortality. Obviously, comorbidities do include non-communicable diseases. And in the context of COVID, we've seen how, for example, those who suffer with diabetes are at high risk uh, of uh, both morbidity and, and mortality. So in the context of comorbidities, FINE is certainly looking at uh, leveraging of their 20 years of experience in, in infectious diseases to, to make sure we, we treat the patient as a whole with its comorbidities associated with the infectious diseases. So it is part of that strategy. 
makes complete sense there, Jeweled. Um, Peter, kind of building on that, but moving back to infectious diseases, um, you talked a lot about tuberculosis in your initial comments. Um, what lessons do you think we can learn from coronavirus to apply to other major health threats like tuberculosis? What's gone well that we should be applying to these other infectious diseases? Is Peter there? Oh, I don't know. I think we've lost him. Oh, yeah. um, oh, you... Brilliant. What can we learn from our approach to COVID for others? We, 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 we have learned a lot from, uh, from, from uh, the community role in, in tuberculosis, and, and that is the referral system, how the referral system works. And it has worked very well where communities uh, screen uh, 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 patients that are asymptomatic and refer them to the health facilities. We have also learned how the communities are the drivers of identifying those, uh, those people who have been infected within the community. Uh, and I think that's, that's a rich experience that we could have been brought to COVID where communities uh, having been trained and their capacity built can be able to have a, 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 a referral system, including transportation of sputum, or any other specimens for diagnostics. And lastly, I think we can also build a system where we can develop community-based testing other than the healthcare, because the healthcare facilities um, are congested. So we can use that strategy of the community to have diagnostics that are community-friendly so that this one can help us catch up uh, a number of people who are, uh, are, are symptomatic uh, uh, to COVID. So outreach as well as people going to the health system is key. Um, a very, very interesting answer. Um, I want to just quickly move on to Hayat. Um, that, you know, a question about how would we validate coronavirus tests? How do we make sure that they're accurate? In lots of parts of the world, you know, we've had unsubstantiated kits flooding the market that haven't been properly validated. Um, Hayat, what sort of, what do you think we need to do to kind of manage that risk? I think it's um, for me to, to ensure um, um, equitable uh, and affordable quality uh, vaccine uh, vaccine, uh, you know, to all uh, our member countries and to the world. Definitely, we need to uh, uh, focus a lot on technology and, and innovation, and especially the digital health. And we've been forced now to uh, to be to do everything digitally. So digital health and digital transformation will be one of the key, uh, you know, uh, area that we need to include in our package. And also uh, uh, advocate uh, among policymakers the global health data governance principles because you can see that with the with the cloud computing, Internet of Things, big data, uh, blockchain, artificial intelligence, really they play a critical role for uh, monitoring, tracking, and enhanced prevention measure against spread of COVID-19. Also, the strength in the, the whole supply chain in terms of the including of technology transfer, certification, manufacturing, it can monitor that. And also, it can play a, a critical role to give you end-to-end -end type of monitoring. And it can also provide transparency, feasibility, all the uh, stakeholders can be also um, uh, um, make sure that their own uh, different information is stored and on and managed in a in better way. So the, the internet of things, the, the digital transformation, digital health is a critical, is a crucial. And you can see from the two, um, from the two uh, example I, I, uh, I, pr I presented, you know, without the digital health and how are you going to connect 200 million people with a, a good logistic, uh, transparent, end-to-end uh, -to, -end to, to the beneficiary system without having that digitalized and cooperate. So we are in the Islamic Development Bank investing heavily on digital health and digital transformation that include in our package in terms of uh, our service and delivery and um, our recommendation. Thank you very much. Um, I think we've got time for one more question. So I'm going to go to uh, Desiree again. Um, how can and should the private industry engage with public partners to create the sustainable health um, system that everyone's kind of described? Um, and what, if anything, is actually missing from our current approach? 
I think there, there needs to be, um, you know, the, the awareness is actually there. So the, the biggest issue is just making sure that uh, the industry really engages and understands um, what, what are the, the, the main areas that they can invest in, um, explaining how the market can work. Um, there are areas which is, which is unfortunately market failure. So I do think that that's an area where um, co-investment of uh, public and private players would be really important. And that's not only for uh, research and development, but also when you're thinking about rolling out um, uh, testing in, in, uh, in, in facilities. I do think that, and there's another question that came up on, on IP, um, you know, how do we make sure that, um, that there is really responsible management of intellectual property um, that fosters uh, the availability of, uh, of uh, tests uh, and, and tests and technologies that, uh, that need to be there, uh, reagents that need to be there to, to really make sure that these are available. I think that awareness um, needs to be uh, uh, definitely uh, kept high, um, you know, use, co use the, the momentum that we have achieved with, with COVID-19 to keep the industry uh, engaged, look for a wider, more diverse group of companies um, to really get involved uh, from all over the world um, and really look at um, good practices, uh, best practices for how do you actually uh, make sure that um, products are made available and the right capacity is actually brought into place and try to pro pro promote those sort of uh, uh, good practices. So that way you see more investment coming forward. Absolutely. Um, I wish I could quiz you more, all of you more on all these issues, but I think we're running out of time. So let's move on um, and keep, I'm sure these conversations can continue on social media afterwards. Um, I think if anything, though, that this, our comments and our discussions have demonstrated that, yes, the pandemic shone a spotlight on the role of testing, but we really can't let that lift because there's so much work left to be doing, whether around access, other diseases, um, etc. But to take these discussions forward, I'm really pleased to now introduce the Honourable Aminata Tori, who is the President of the Economic, Social and Environment Council of Senegal and the former Prime Minister. She's also currently a Goodwill Ambassador for FIND, um, where she passionately champions equitable access to diagnostics. So, um, Dr Tori, I turn the floor over to you to hear your recommendations and reflections. Thank you. Oh, I think you're still on mute. Um, brilliant, thanks. No, I'm muted. Uh, thank you very much. I uh, really would like to uh, uh, express my appreciation about uh, you know, all the panelists, uh, very good points. Um, and I think um, the diversity and the angle they each of them choose uh, sort of would help us to um, sort of uh, uh, express um, our, our recommendation um, to, um, you know, the, 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 the meeting that is coming up, that is a very important one, the Global Health Summit that will uh, be held on 21st May uh, and the, uh, 50, that's the 74th uh, World Health uh, Assembly. Uh, I think it's very important after all this very um, sort of um, important and deep, uh, deep uh, deeply thought um, uh, um, um, uh, um, uh, high level meeting that we sort of formulate and bring all these ideas together, um, you know, to sort of reach out to those who are going to take the decision globally. Um, let me recall um, some numbers, but I think it's important that we recall, we, you know, we are professional ourselves, we do know that. Uh, myself, I work in uh, reproductive health for 25 years with UNFPA before, you know, going to government. Um, but in 2020, uh, let's remember, uh, let's remember that uh, one in five health facility across Africa, where I'm sitting, uh, only one in five uh, had access to COVID-19 tests. Myself, I was impacted by this number. A good friend of mine, you know, who was um, a, a great personality here, um, you know, it took him six days to, re to, to realize that he had COVID and he passed. Uh, my own brother had to go to emergency because, you know, he dragged this fever that looks like, um, uh, you know, the flu um, and, you know, uh, spent 12 days in, in, in emergency room, luckily he recovered. So this number has an impact. 
uh, and I think it's very, very important that we, we know that. In low and middle income countries, the most basic testing capacities is 1% of primary uh, uh, care clinics, 1%. Um, and we do know that uh, testing tool do not uh, exist for 50% of the top 20 diseases worldwide. So we see the gap that we need to fill. Uh, it, it seems to me uh, very, very, very important. Um, I, I, I think that's Peter who, who recalled how his mother, uh, you know, used to, you know, use her experience to send him to, uh, to, the, uh, to the health center in case of uh, malaria or suspicion of, suspicion of malaria. Uh, it it shows us that if we really would like to achieve universal health care, testing is um, uh, critical. I think it's very important that we, we express that, um, you know, as a recommendation of our high level uh, forum. Uh, let's uh, remember the title, testing is the first line of defense against pre preventing future pandemics. Uh, and, and that is, is, is to be recalled. So we have to call upon the World Health Organization. I think it's not gonna be difficult to do that because we have our good friend, uh, Theodoros, who, who joined us and thank you for being here too. But also we have to talk to the European Union, to the African Union and the, and the head of states uh, from the G20 and the G7 presidency. They must acknowledge that uh, pandemics preparedness and response, as well as the uh, attainment of universal health care. But I would like to say access to universal health itself. Uh, it was the, the point was made, um, I think, uh, by, 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 by Sarah, I mean, it's, it's more about care, it's about health as a whole, uh, you know, rights. I think it's important that we, we frame it that way. Uh, and they have to acknowledge that if we want to reach that, uh, we need a comprehensive, fully funded strategy for diagnostic testing. I think that is also very, very important that we, that we look into, in, well, that we look into that. Uh, I, I think it's also important uh, that, uh, uh, we have a uh, global uh, collaboration for innovation and we need also to coordinate agenda um, that are multi-sectorial. That's why I really appreciate uh, uh, the, the, how the, this, this panel was put together. We can see different angle, uh, you know, from, uh, from Dr. Cindy, who is from the Islamic Bank, I mean, the, the parliament and also um, different other actors, communities, um, you know, uh, global institution. I think together that's how we are going uh, to, 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 to do that. And I think it's innovation and cooperation are, are, are really key in, uh, in, 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 in realizing, um, you know, that uh, comprehensive uh, policy national and globally as it relates to, to, to testing. Um, and, and, and let me say also that it's very important that we build a real partnership that would, that would help, uh, really help, um, that would help countries in the South um, to develop and produce their own testing. It's not about just, you know, giving them the testing. They should have the capacity to do that. Uh, Institute Pasteur, which is a fully Senegalese institution, um, produce testing, um, you know, um, Mazir, which is the foundation of Mazir in, 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 in Morocco, produce also testing. So we should make sure uh, that this cooperation reinforce self, uh, you know, dependent, capacities uh, in the South so they can produce that. Um, I think that is very, very important. Uh, and we have to salute uh, the successful effort from uh, the ACT Accelerated Diagnostic Pillar that is co-led by, by FINE and the Global Fund. Uh, and we have to make sure that it, it results in, uh, in creating a permanent diagnostic alliance. That alliance, its, uh, its main goal, as I said, is of course to steer up um, you know, scientific collaboration, but also to sort of gather all the actors to reinforce self-reliance in test to produ production in, 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 the, in the South too. I think it's very, very important um, that uh, uh, we, we, we do that. Um, let's remember also that uh, 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 in alignment with the recommendation from the Independent Panel for Pandemic Preparedness and Responses 2021 reports, uh, G7 countries, um, you know, have to commit 60% um, of the uh, $19 billion required by uh, the ACT accelerator in 2021. Uh, 
uh, so it's important that uh, that also uh, occur. Uh, that, that, I think that the, 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 the meeting is has to be really, you know, uh, concrete. It has to lead to very concrete decision. And funding is, of course, uh, one of the most important decision that they have to uh, they have to achieve. But not only in the world, but in also putting their hands in the pocket and putting the money on the table. So I think that is very very important uh, when it comes to international cooperation. Um, this will really uh, help. Uh, research institute, diagnostic developers, manufacturers, healthcare workers, uh, to really uh, be able uh, to, 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 to create a roadmap for uh, sort of a, a, a suitable and sustainable diagnostic system. That is very, very important for us. If for, um, you know, all the diseases, quote to quote, like malaria, we are still, um, you know, sort of having the issue, um, let alone, uh, you know, the emerging and the upcoming uh, pandemics, we have to get prepared to that. So if we are prepared to that, I think we will be prepared to handle the best way um, uh, uh, the upcoming uh, pande uh, pandemics, because that's the, the, the world we, we live in. I think it's also important that uh, really, really, uh, we sort of uh, stop uh, this highly dependency on a small numbers of countries that manufacture diagnostic tests. And within those countries, we have seen the fight around masks, the fight on still going. I think, I mean, the, the intensity is, is lower now around, uh, you know, vaccine and et cetera. So I think that has to stop because otherwise we are in, in market sort of based uh, um, decision and strategies. And then uh, we lose lives, uh, you know, uh, in, in between. Uh, so this testing nationalism and broken supply chain demonstrate the needs uh, for change in manufacturing uh, toward a more focused, resilient, effective approach and based on, on, on solidarity, and also with uh, the objective of making sure that countries can help themselves. Um, sitting here in Senegal, I, I think it's possible because we have done that. As I said, uh, the foundation of Mashri did that also in, in Morocco. So I think that's the way to go if we want to have universal access to testing. Um, we need also to support the development of national essential diagnostic list. I think it's, it's important. Uh, it's based on, uh, you know, WHO um, uh, list, um, and it has to be uh, funded by national action plan. That's where, I mean, what is going to be discussed um, in, in Rome has to come down and be owned uh, by uh, countries and reflected uh, within the health budget. That is very, very important that we do that. Because what we are seeing is sort of a rush now to secure a vaccine, which is important, but we have also to take this opportunity um, to support testing for COVID, but testing per se itself. Um, we, that, that's an opportunity. That's a few opportunities that COVID is giving us, actually. After all, we went through a million of people died and et cetera, but let's uh, take it as something that could you know, help the other diseases that testing is the number one uh, you know, sort of priority uh, along, of course, with so many, but that one tend to be forgotten. Um, and, 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 and we have to sort of make sure that uh, the leaders that will uh, uh, get together will, 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 will hear that. Um, we have to also recognize, and I think it was said um, when we talked about uh, community intervention, we have to recognize that uh, uh, testing doesn't only occur in the health system. It has to also uh, be integrated in the society as a whole. I'm thinking about the schools, the workplaces, the, the, the border uh, crossing, uh, transportation, uh, wherever you can quickly, uh, you know, know uh, whether, I mean, uh, you know, we are in a, in a safe place or not, uh, let alone self-testing uh, beyond healthcare setting. I think it's, it's very, very important if we saw the scale and the numbers uh, that got uh, infected of COVID, of course, it has to be uh, really, 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 we have to make sure that people can help themselves. Countries should help themselves. People should help themselves very quickly at a very affordable uh, affordable cost. Um, that uh, is something that also we should sort of put forward. It came out of uh, the different intervention uh, we, 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 we heard. I think it's also important to, to, to support um, innovating digital health solution uh, in Senegal that was uh, really, it really helped um, in terms of facilitating diagnostic. Now 
your results, you get them when you want to travel, your test, you get it, uh, you know, in your, in your, in your phone. Um, but it should not only be about that. It should be about, um, you know, um, the whole chain. Uh, I feel uh, the symptoms, what do I do? Um, you know, I can, I can, I can quickly, um, you know, sort of uh, using uh, digital devices, um, uh, get informed and know what to do. Um, you know, we, we have to use uh, artificial intelligence. I think it's important. Uh, mobile monitoring uh, device, uh, etc. All the self-testing tool that lend themselves uh, to digital uh, mode. Uh, it, it should be. It should be. It should be uh, really supported. And this is something that speaks to Africa, because I always uh, recall that um, we have more cell phone than the U.S. and Canada combined in Africa. People don't seem to realize that. So it's a, it's a great tool that lends itself also uh, to the topic we are, we, are, we, are, we are talking about. We also have to build um, diagnostic literacy among uh, policymakers, uh, starting by politicians themselves, uh, politicians like me. Um, you know, they are the ones voting the budgets. Um, you know, we have to advocate for a specific budget line uh, in health budget when they come to the parliament uh, to, that, to get uh, the, the, the vote for their budget. We have to make sure that, you know, that line is there. And it's, it's important that we recall that also uh, to decision makers. And I think it's important that we get, um, you know, community involved, uh, media, uh, especially in low and middle income uh, countries um, to sort of, uh, you know, enhance the confidence and the understanding of why we are using uh, testing. Because we still are dealing with stereotypes, um, you know, uh, wrong ideas, uh, about, you know, whatever gets into your body or whatever lend itself to, you know, you giving something that you don't know where it goes. <laughs> you know, that's yeah. because unfortunately, uh, we do have in the past a very sad experience of substandard research and, and, and things like that. So I think uh, we need to uh, really reinforce public confidence um, and in all aspects uh, in order to, to, to tackle uh, this, this issue of, of testing that is, again, the key investment for pandemic preparedness and response and also for achieving universal health care or universal access to health as a human right. Thank you. Thank you so much. What a fantastic wrap up of all of the ideas that we've talked about and a true call to action for world leaders. I think what you say about building literacy in politicians, Sarah mentioned it earlier, but how important um, as we've heard, testing really is the linchpin in this pandemic, but also to address future health emergencies and capacity in part of the globe is just not enough. We need to really roll that up more broadly even. Um, so just to reiterate um, the recommendations for the World Health Assembly and world leaders, which Dr. Torre touched on, will be have been shared in the chat and they'll be emailed to you afterwards and also published on the online website. Um, to close, what I hope you all agree has been a very engaging and insightful discussion. I want to hand back to Dr. Sergio Carmona. Um, over to you, Sergio. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, good to see Bill's cameras on. And uh, today is also a, a really important event uh, for FIND. I want to take the opportunity to introduce an old friend, colleague, uh, um, as the new CEO, Dr. Bill Rodriguez, who will be joining FIND officially from, from the 1st of July. Bill um, is returning to FIND. Uh, he was previously uh, the chief medical officer between 2015 and 2017. And in between, he's now been at the uh, DRK Foundation. He's a medical doctor with extensive experience across both private and um, uh, public sector. He has been an entrepreneur and founded his own diagnostic company a while back. Um, he's, needless to say, highly respected figure uh, in global health, uh, served as an advisor at WHO, at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, both national governments, and, and we've worked together in the past you know, on HIV and other infectious diseases. So Bill, what can I say? Welcome back. It, I look forward to you joining us uh, the 1st of July and, and the whole of FIND is, is eager to, to see you arrived uh, here. So why don't you take the opportunity also to conclude with some key messages for all of us? And yeah, thanks for joining this meeting ahead of uh, 1st of July. Over to you, Bill. Yeah, thanks so much, Sergio, uh, for that warm and heartfelt and not quite brief enough introduction, but I appreciate the accolades. Um, 
uh, before I actually get to these uh, two brief remarks that I'll make, I just want to um, uh, reiterate what Sarah said, just express my gratitude for the organizers of today's event. It's obviously a very important event um, for FINE as we launch our new strategy. The, uh, the opening remarks that came from the Director General and Peter Sands and the quality of the discussion led by the panelists. I was just looking through the 25 or 30 questions in the, in the chat box and I'm just impressed at how much depth and engagement and critical questions are being, um, are being asked. And obviously we just barely scratched the surface on some of those today. So I'll look forward to engaging with many of you in the future as we try to continue this discussion and really try to deliver on, on the promise of testing around the world. Um, I'll keep my remarks brief. I know the hour's late for many of us. Um, and um, I'll just have two brief remarks. Uh, first is just to introduce myself to those of you who don't know me. My name is Bill Rodriguez, and as uh, Sergio mentioned, I'll be um, coming in to find as the incoming Chief Executive Officer on the 1st of July. It's great. It's gratifying to see so many um, familiar uh, names in the participant list today. Um, I'm looking forward to renewing some, some old friendships and partnerships and some new acquaintances, and there's many of you who I don't yet know, but look forward to getting to know um, when I arrive to find in, in just seven. And I'll look forward to this ongoing discussion. Um, the second remark I want to make is just calling back to something that Peter Sand said early on in uh, 90 minutes ago in, in this high-level forum. He mentioned, I think, that he'd learned more about testing uh, in the past 15 months than he ever thought he would know in his lifetime. Um, and I think that's uh, an important telling remark. And if, if you recall, when SARS-CoV-2 was first uh, identified, it took 13 days to develop the first PCR test, the qualified PCR test, which in the testing world, as, as many of you know, is breathtaking speed. And it parallels the breathtaking taking speed we saw in the development of COVID therapeutics and, and COVID vaccines. And I think it speaks to the power of um, what can happen when you provide resources and attention and a, and a global focus on uh, delivering a promise around uh, better health, including testing. And yet, and yet, uh, I think we would all acknowledge that uh, this exhausting effort led by many of you trying to deliver, develop and deliver and provide access to testing for COVID around the world. We can all look at where we are today as the pandemic continues to wreak havoc across our communities and, and recognize that as much as we can celebrate uh, the successes of the past 15 months, we're not there yet. And there's an enormous amount of work ahead of us uh, that has to be done. And uh, as much as we want to rest on uh, some of the successes that we've seen in testing, it's too early to rest in, in, in this pandemic for sure. And to think back to what Peter said about uh, testing as the cornerstone of, of both public health and, and patient care, we've learned that that's true not just in COVID and not just in pandemics and global health security, but we're now, we're now clear that that's a critical element of the entire um, health enterprise. And that's why these two pillars, that's, that's a big part of the fine strategy that we're launching today on, on global health security and on universal health coverage are so, it's, it's hard to separate those two. And then I'll just end by reflecting on the second thing that Peter Sand said, which is it's not just about testing, it's about partnerships. And I think we've seen the power of uh, working together in partnership with communities on the ground, with advocates, with uh, organizations around the world to try to deliver on, on this promise. And I think while we're not quite there, we can agree from today's discussion that there's a shared vision that we can strive towards equitable, affordable access to testing for everyone, not just for COVID, but for all conditions. And so I'll look forward to joining everyone in just a few weeks and helping uh, guide us through that effort as we embark on this new strategy over the next few years. Thanks, Sergio, for the, for the warm introduction. Thanks to everyone who participated today. And I'll turn it over to Sarah for uh, final closing remarks from the forum. Thanks very much, Bill. And I'm sure everyone's very excited to be working with you. And as a journalist, I look forward to seeing what you and all of the members of the panel continue to do around testing over the coming months. Um, there's obviously a lot of work to do, and I'm sure we'll be asking you all many more questions in the coming months and years. Um, so today has been an incredibly engaging com uh, conversation with lots of ideas, we've covered a lot of ground. I hope you continue discussion as on social media with that hashtag transforming testing. And don't forget to check your inbox for the recommendations for the outcome of the event. Um, with that, I'll end it. Thank you all for joining us. Um, have a lovely day or what you've got left of it, depending on the time.
time zone um, and look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks everyone, bye.